Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, so today um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, cortic surfaces, so hypersurfaces in P3, um, up to volume preserving equivalents. So this uh, subject, I guess, um, falls into the realm of log calabial geometry. So I'll start with a quick review of log calabial varieties and how we understand the geometry of log calabial varieties, and then I'll get on to the bit about quartic surfaces. So what is a log calabial pair? Um, log calabial pair is uh, a pair. Uh, we ask it has log canonical singularities, so it's a kind of minimal requirement on the how bad the singularities can be from the minimal model program. And here x is a, a proper Q factorial variety of a complex number, say, and uh, the delta there is a reduced effective integral V divisor, and it's anti-canonical. So Kx plus delta x is linearly trivial. So you could generalize that maybe in one of two ways. You could potentially ask for the divisor not to necessarily be integral, but maybe just a Q divisor, or you could ask not just for linear equivalence, but Q linear equivalence. So if you do either of those two things, some of the things that I say today won't be true. So this is why I restrict to this more kind of restrictive setting in which you've really got an integral V device as the boundary. And the interior of this space uh, is something called a log Calabial variety. So the reason for that is that it behaves kind of like a non-compact version of a Calabial variety. So in particular, one way in which it generalizes the notion of a Calabial variety is that you can define a volume form on it, non-vanishing polymorphic volume form by taking a global section of this space here. So um, this divisor is trivial, so global section says C, I can pick a generator of that thing it's uniquely determined up to scaling, and that is um, that thing is a volume form on U, which extends to the volume form on X that has simple poles along the boundary there. So uh, here's an example just to give some kind of, you know, grounding. Let's consider a simple example. I could consider pairs of the form projective plane P2 and a cubic curve. So cubic curves are the empty canonical curves inside P2. The curve could be smooth. It could be singular. But if it is singular, then it can only have at worst nodal singularities. So anything worse than nodal singularities in a pair like this, so for example, cusps or tack nodes or multiple components, and then this pair fails to be log canonical. So to summarize, you know, you've got the case in which the boundary divider is smooth that I've drawn on the left there. So there's obviously a one parameter family of those parameterized by the J invariant of the cubic curve there. And then there are precisely three other cases, and those are all nodal. So the nodal cubic, the line and conic, where the line's not tangent to the conic, and then the three lines meeting in a triangle like that. So those three guys are all, there's exactly only one of each of them because all of the nodal cubics, for example, are projectively equivalent. And as we'll see in a minute, the kind of properties of this surface U, this open surface, or the behavior of it depends crucially on whether we're in this smooth case or this nodal case. So let me explain why. The key to kind of understanding how to think about the geometry in, of these spaces is to understand what their log canonical centers are. So uh, if you know, hopefully this is just a recap definition from minimal model program theory, but uh, the discrepancy. So if you've got a map from a smooth variety, say Z to X and E is a divisor in X over Z, then you can define the discrepancy of this divisor with respect to the pair X delta X so the discrepancy is just the coefficient that you that appears in front of this divisor e uh, in this formula here so it's a standard definition and log canonical centers so if the so if the pair is log canonical the smallest value the log the, the discrepancy can take is minus one and if the divisor has discrepancy minus one then the image of the divisor in this variety x is called a log canonical center so when i push it when I take the image of pi of e back down to x. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, then 
you know, in terms of having the right intuition here, the best possible thing to think about is when X is smooth and the boundary is a simple normal crossings divisor. So if you're in a case of a smooth variety with a simple normal crossing divisor, then the log canonical centers of this pair are exactly the strata of delta X. So each stratum is itself a log canonical center. And we also kind of also convenient to think of X as being a log canonical center of itself. And so if we were to look at our previous example of cubic curves, the pair has more log canonical centers if the boundary divisor is nodal, because the, the nodes are each log canonical centers themselves. If the curve is just a smooth curve, then the only log canonical center it has is just the curve itself. And um, you can think that in general, log canonical centers, so in the in for general log canonical pair, obviously you can have much worse things happening than than simple normal crossings. But essentially, in some sense, the log canonical center is a kind of generalization of what it means for the boundary divisor to have a stratum in some sense. So uh, now that we've defined log labial pairs, it's um, good to have a notion of kind of birational equivalence, so we can start trying to classify them up to birational equivalence. And the right notion here is called volume preserving equivalence. I'll explain why on the next slide. But this is the kind of formal definition. So if I've got a morphism, a proper birational morphism from one pair to another, then that's volume preserving if the boundary divisor uh, so kx plus delta x, when I pull that back, I get kz plus delta z. Of course, if these are log collabial, then they're both trivial. And when I push forward the boundary from upstairs, I get the boundary downstairs. So kind of two natural uh, conditions. And a birational map is volume preserving if you can resolve it by birational morphisms. So perhaps one thing I forgot to mention on the slide here is that these are the guy in the middle here that sits at the top, the z delta z, even if x delta x and y delta y are log collabial, the guy in the middle might not be because the boundary divisor doesn't need to be effective in this definition. But um, but there you go. Uh, but here's some kind of slightly nicer way to think about it, perhaps. If you've got a volume preserving birational map, then I can look at the open log collabial open subset of x and the u sorry, U being the, the interior of X and V being the interior of Y, then a volume preserving map between these two spaces has to preserve the volume form. Well, the volume forms only defined up to a, up to a multiplication by a scalar, but as long as you've appropriately scaled the volume form on each side, then when you pull back the volume form by this birational map on X to Y, they should agree. Moreover, a birational, a volume preserving birational map always preserves discrepancies. So if I've got an exceptional divisor E over both X and Y, the discrepancies are always the same. And if I compose two volume preserving birational maps together, then the composition is volume preserving. So for example, if I have vol volume preserving self maps form a group, for example, And so we want to kind of come up with some invariants that volume preserving maps have to um, preserve. And the easiest or the most kind of fundamental invariant is this invariant called the co-regularity, or uh, there's other ways to think about it. But um, because a volume preserving map preserves discrepancies, it has to send a log canonical center onto a log canonical center. And using this, you can define this invariant called the co-regularity. So it's the dimension of the smallest log canonical center in X, or at least that's how we would like to define it. But unfortunately, log canonical pairs are a little bit not as well behaved as we would like. So you have to kind of make a partial resolution before you do the definition. And the right type of partial resolution is to make this volume preserving DLT modification. But you could think about it as like a volume preserving resolution of singularities, if you like. And again, in terms of the intuition, intuitive example that we had before, if you've got a smooth variety with a simple normal crossings boundary divisor, then this co-regularity, this invariant, the co-regularity is just the dimension of 
the smallest stratum of the boundary. And that's a good way to think about it. So if you've got a volume preserving map between simple normal crossings pairs, for example, then it has to send, you know, the dimension of the smallest boundary stratum in the boundary has to be the same on both sides. So obviously the way that I've just defined it, this co-regularity is an integer and it's an integer between zero and the dimension of X. If it equals the dimension of X, then it must mean that the boundary has no components. Uh, so the boundary divisor is trivial and X is a Clebyel variety. So at one end of the spectrum, this co-regularity sees Clebyel varieties. And at the other end of the spectrum, when C is equal to zero, you can think about this as saying that the boundary divisor has to have a zero stratum. So that's a, a point where uh, the dimension of X number of um, components meet, uh, at least in the simple normal crossings case. And in that case, we say that the pair is maximal, which is uh, maximally degenerate. And so, for example, an example of a maximal pair, toric pairs. So if you've got a toric, a complete toric variety with its toric boundary, those are always maximal. So basically, whatever toric boundary stratum corresponds to a full dimensional cone in the fan of X, that is going to be a zero dimensional log canonical center in X. And maximal pairs are also, you know, on the opposite end of the spectrum to log collab. I mean, Calabi Alvarite is also very obviously very interesting, but also the maximal case is also very interesting because um, they crop up in the gross Siebert program and uh, they're expected to have some rather fantastic properties that generalize the fantastic properties that toric varieties have. Uh, these are kind of conjectured from mirror symmetry. So, you know, some you know, to do with canonical bases of the um, uh, coordinate rings of these spaces. And you can generalize some of the combinatorial machinery of toric geometry to understand them. And obviously, since toric variety, so all toric pairs are volume preserving equivalent because basically the interior of one guy uh, is a torus and the interior of the other guy is a torus. And, you know, if you if you just write down an isomorphism between the two tori, you can extend that to a volume preserving map after blowing up. So toric pairs are always volume preserving equivalent to each other. And therefore we say that a pair has a toric model if it's volume preserving equivalent to a toric pair. So in some sense, these are the simplest examples. So this is the simplest birational equivalence class of log Clebyel, maximal log Clebyel pairs. Um, but it's even though it's kind of the, the most fundamental or basic birational equivalence class, it's still a very difficult, seems to be a very difficult problem to give a characterization of exactly when a maximal log Calabial pair is birationally equivalent or volume preserving equivalent to a toric pair. Sorry if you've heard my kids causing a ruckus in the background. Uh, and so what we know about these in dimension two, um, at least this appears, I don't, I think, well, this theorem or this proposition appears in the, in the, in the paper of Gross Hacking and Kiel of mirror symmetry for log Clebyel surfaces. Every um, two dimensional maximal log Clebyel pair has a toric model. So in the two dimensional case, the, this birational equivalence class of toric, you know, everything is birationally volume preserving equivalent sorry to a toric model so that really contains everything uh, in particular it implies that if you have a maximal two-dimensional maximal log Clebyel pair then the x has to be rational and so if we were to return to our um, example of pairs in the plane p2 in a cubic curve we see that the co-regularity of this pair equals one if and only if the divisor is smooth because in that case the dimension the, the minimal log canonical center is the smooth elliptic curve and there are no smaller ones and it's equal to zero if the divide if the boundary divisor has a node because in that case the node is the minimal log canonical center so this invariant really separates out those two classes that i told you we had and from the 
result on the last slide, we know that the nodal cases must all be volume preserving equivalent to a toric thing. So that tells you uh, that we must be able to find some volume preserving maps that map P2 with a toric with a bound nodal boundary divisor onto P2 with a triangle. And you can do that by just writing down some explicitly some Cremona transformations that are volume preserving. So here, for example, if I if I pick um, these pictures are telling me so a Cremona transformation, birational maps of the plane are generated by Cremona transformations and Cremona transformations have exactly three base points. And the way the map works is it blows up the three base points and it contracts the, the lines that that go between them. So if I let the three base points be three points on this nodal cubic with one at the node, I blow those three points up and I can track the lines between them. That's a birational map of the plane and it sends this cubic, nodal cubic, onto a conic. And at, over this point where the node is, it pulls out an exceptional line, which is this um, vertical line in the middle. And so you can check using the definition you were to resolve that map with the delpets of degree six in the middle, write down all of the boundary device and everything, you'd find that it's volume preserving if I allow this exceptional divisor to be part of the boundary. And the condition to be volume preserving in this case is exactly that the base points lie in the boundary. So another way of saying it is that they have to be a points of discrepancy at least, well, minus one or zero. The points with the discrepancy minus one contribute new components to the boundary and the points with discrepancy zero don't. So here I've got two points of discrepancy zero that lie on the smooth part of the curve and one at the node. And the three points on the right of the side of the map, they're the, 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 the base points for the inverse transformation. So you can see the two points on the line there contract the line because that line gets contracted. And once you've got from the nodal cubic to the line in the conic, you can go from the line in the conic to the triangle of lines by picking base points like that. Uh, so you can just untwist this nodal cubic to a triangle of lines just by, by following this procedure. So it's nice and easy. So I'm going to talk to you now about cortic surfaces. What I would like to do is prove that very simple result for P2, but now but prove it for P3. So log canonical pairs of the form P3 in a quartic surface. And obviously quartic surfaces are a lot more complicated than cubic curves. So um, first of all, let's understand uh, what different cases we expect to see. So our fundamental invariant in this case is the co-regularity and the co-regularity can take one of three values. It can be zero, one or two. If the co-regularity is two, then this pair of P3 and this quartic surface is canonical. So it means that the boundary divisor has to be an irreducible quartic K3 surface with a, at worst two valve singularities. And in the remaining cases, so the cases in which the, the co-regularity is zero or one, this pair has to have therefore a strictly log canonical singularity. So if it has a strictly log canonical singularity, then the co-regularity has to be at, at most one. Otherwise, it's canonical and you're in the case of co-regularity two. And this trichotomy, the value of C being two, zero, or one, it corresponds completely exactly to the case in which if you were to pick a pencil, of, if you were to deform the quartic to a smooth quartic, by picking a pencil of quartic K3 surfaces that goes through this point, then you would have a degeneration therefore of, of K3 surfaces. And if this degenerate, if this degenerate fiber, this delta in the middle of this degeneration is a degeneration of type one, two or three, that's exactly corresponding to this trichotomy where the co-regularity is two, zero, one or zero. So if you know about degenerations of K3 surfaces, you probably find that remark very helpful. And if you don't, feel free to ignore it. So what can we say about surfaces, the cases in which the, the pair has co-regularity too? So this is the case which is closest to being, you know, the kind of, it's closer to being a lot clabbier than it is to being maximal. 
So I think this is going to be a very difficult case to really understand, but Araujo, Corti and Massarenti study these types of pairs. So their work hasn't appeared yet, I don't think, but but they um, they look at pairs of this form. And as I told you, volume preserving self maps of pairs like this form a group. So they actually look at the birational volume group of volume preserving self maps of a pair like this. And they completely describe this group in the case in which this cortic is a very general smooth cortic, in particular has Picard rank one. And also in the case in which it's a very general cortic, but it has one ordinary double point. And if you've got an ordinary double point, then you can blow that thing up and follow some kind of volume preserving Sarkisov link. And you get an interesting non-trivial birational automorphism. But in the case of the very general smooth cortic, I think they essentially show that um, this volume preserving birational automorphism group is only given by automorphisms of P3 that fix the cortic surface. So basically it's very, there aren't very, very many maps in this case. It's a very rigid, difficult um, uh, thing to, to work with. But, you know, if I want to actually explicitly classify all of these pairs of this form up to volume preserving equivalence, this is likely to be, I think, a, a very difficult problem and certainly something that I don't have anything to, more to say about than what has already been said. So, for an example, why, the, why is this a subtle problem? Well, there's an example due to Agiso that tells you that isomorphic cortic surfaces in P3, for example, there exists pairs of isomorphic cortic surfaces for which there is no birational automorphism of P3, which sends one of them onto the other. There's no birational automorphism. There's certainly no volume preserving one. So, you know, knowing the isomorphism type of the cortic is, is, is not enough. You also need to know how it's embedded in this space. Um, so, yeah, so I don't touch that, but I do talk about all of the other cases. So in the other cases, this co-regularity, this invariant, is at, at most one. And so I prove the following result. So if you've got a pair, P3, with a boundary divisor and it has co-regularity at most one, then I can show that it's volume preserving equivalent to the following pair. So I take P1 times P2, and I take the following boundary divisor in, in this space. So I've got, I mean, the picture is more, more I think, elucidating than the formula. Uh, if the co-regularity is one, then it looks like a copy of P2 at each end and an elliptic curve cross P1 in the middle. And if the co-regularity is zero, then it looks like a copy of P2 at each end and a triangle of lines in the middle. In particular, that's obviously the toric boundary divisor inside P1 cross P2. So this theorem tells you that if a pair P3 and delta has co-regularity zero, then it emits a toric model. So that shows you that in dimension three, uh, at least when you're looking at P3, everything has a, every maximal pair has a toric model. And so this is a special case of the following conjecture, which um, I guess in some way, shape or form is due to Shukurov, but I didn't track down an exact uh, reference for it. I think he possibly conjectured it rather a bit more optimistically without assuming that X is rational. But if you assume that X is a rational threefold and that this is a log labial pair of co-regularity zero, so maximal co log labial pair, then conjecturally, hopefully, X delta X admits of a volume preserving map onto a toric pair. So he has a toric model. So obviously just prove this for the case in which X is P3. And as we saw before, it holds in dimension two in fact, it holds without assuming that X is rational because being maximal forces X to be rational. But in dimension three, you can be maximal and non-rational. So there are examples of these due to Kalogiros and Svaldi. And unfortunately, then you can use these non-rational threefold examples. So their examples are cortic threefolds, smooth cortic threefolds with maximal boundary divisor. So at least answer fees example is that. 
And once you've got that, you can use that to then cook up examples in for, for P4. So where the boundary in P4 is one of these non-rational cortex or a component in the boundary is one of these non-rational cortex threefold, which means that this conjecture fails actually in dimension four. So it, it really does depend on assuming that it's a rational threefold and it's going to be much more complicated in higher dimensions. And another thing that I should just mention is that this is very similar. Sorry, Tom. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you go back? Mm -hmm. What do you take as delta here for the at, at the bottom for the counterexample? The counterexample. Um, so well, uh, x, x should be smooth, right? In this case, yeah. So x is um. So Anne Sophie has an example is uh, a smooth cortic threefold. And a hyperplane section in that is the boundary divisor, but the hyperplane section has a degenerate cusp singularity. Right. And the cusp singularity is forces that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Easy. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so um, Mella proved a kind of similar result to what I will talk about. So he showed that if you've got a rational cortic surface, so an irreducible rational cortic surface in P3, then you can find a Cremona transformation of P3 that sends this cortic onto a plane. And so in our case, you can use this result that I've proved to prove exactly the same thing as that, but only using volume preserving maps. So another way to say it is that I can find, not only can I send uh, a rational cortic surface onto a plane, but I can preserve a volume form with a pole on that divisor at the same time. And so that's nice, uh, but unfortunately, almost all of the maps, with one special uh, exception that Mela uses to, to do this, to untwist these cortex, don't extend to volume preserving maps. So roughly speaking, in order for my maps to be volume preserving, I need to assume that if if I've got a curve in the base locus of, of the map, it has to live inside the boundary, uh, inside a boundary component. And if I've got a, an isolated point in the base locus of a map like this, it has to be contained in a one stratum or a, a one dimensional log canonical center. So in other words, um, it, the better way to say it is that all the centers in the, bio, in the base locus have to have non-positive discrepancy. Uh, and most of the maps which Mela uses, um, he doesn't really, I mean, of course, he's not bothered about that. So he finds the simplest map in each case, which uh, I have to be a bit more careful. So let me explain an overview of the proof. So, Sorry, Tom, uh, again. Sorry, yeah, yeah, before you start, um, it get technical. Um, I'm trying to remember things. So um, I think. Corti and Chalogiris, they had some sort of um, Sarkis of decomposition paper on yeah. this. Yeah, um, yeah. So they proved that if you've got a birational map um, between a volume preserving birational map between log clavier varieties. Or uh, I see. see. Okay. So you assume in the beginning that the birational map is volume preserving. You assume in the beginning the, the uh, map yeah. is preserving and then you decompose it into volume preserving. Okay, but okay, in, that, that doesn't help with this at all. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now. Yeah. So let me give you an overview of the proof, uh, and then I'll explain, go through a bit, through some bits of it. Um, so, because the co-regularity in my, my, I'm assuming that the co-regularity is at most one. Therefore, this cortic, this pair has to have. Otherwise, it would have co-regularity too. It has to have a, a strictly semi-log canonical singularity, a point at which um, there's a there's a log canonical center. And so, I can, I mean, the literature on cortic surfaces is very long. It goes back to the 1800s, and um, I guess there's an influential book by Jessup from 19. 17 or 19 around about that time uh, which essentially classifies all singular cortic surfaces um, but obviously it's a little bit uh, you know 
quoting from that book, I, d I found it a bit tricky. But so I'll and obvious and and more to the point is that the cortic surfaces can have there's like about four thousand different isomorphism classes of of or equisingularity classes of cortic surfaces. So uh, you're not going to do it the same way in the explicit way that we did the cubic curves. But I can classify, I can kind of divide them up into deformation families and 11 deformation families I, I, that contain every single cortex. So my classes are A, B, C, and so A are the general member in one of these families in class A is um, an irreducible cortic surface with an isolated simple elliptic singularity. So simple elliptic singularities degenerate to cusp singularities and then, you know, and then even further into to worse stuff. The class B, the general member in class B is an irreducible non-normal cortic surface. And in class C, I'm considering pairs of reducible cortic surfaces. So where the boundary divisor splits up a bit. And then once I've defined these 11 classes, I can define volume preserving maps between the general member of one of them and a special member of another one that kind of link all of these families together. And I get the following diagram. So I've got these four families of type A, which have isolated singularities, and these four fa three families of type B, which have curves of singularities, and these four families of type C, which are reducible. And basically, I find one map that sends me from one family into another until I reach family C4 in the bottom right there. And by definition, in my you know, definition of these families, C4 is the case in which the boundary divisor consists of a plane and the cone over a cubic curve. And in that case, when I've reached the case in which the boundary divisor is given by a plane and the cone over a cubic curve, proving the theorem becomes very easy. Um, so the key part of the problem is to define these five, 11 families and then define the maps between them. So let me explain who the 11 families are. They depend obviously on the on the classification of semi-log canonical hypersurface singularities. So these are, I'm not exactly sure who to attribute to, but uh, in any case, um, semi-log canonical hypersurface singularities are well known and there's a table of cases which is this table here and so the first four cases in the table the simple elliptic and cusp singularities they're isolated singularities so those are points at which we have an isolated singularity the simple elliptic singularities these look like essentially look like cones over elliptic curves in various embeddings of elliptic curves so for, obviously you can see the equations there. They're like one step worse than the Duval singularities. The cusp singularities, they're kind of degenerations of these simple elliptic singularities. And then you've the, the, the five lines at the bottom of the table, they're all non-isolated singularities. And so if you've got not, if you've got a curve of singularities, non-isolated singularities, then the surface has to have at worst double points along that curve. Um, at the generic point of that curve. So if it has triple points along a curve, it won't be it won't be log canonical, but it can have double points. So the generic case, obviously, at most of the way along the curve, it just looks like a normal crossings point, but it can have some of these pinch points and it can have some of these degenerate cusps. And if it has a degenerate cusp or a cusp, then the pair has to have co-regularity zero because these force you, you to have a zero a zero dimensional log canonical center if you've only got simple elliptic singularities normal crossings and pinch points then uh, then it's uh, uh, has co-regularity one so the type of singularities that you have also tells you picks out for you kind of the co-regularity and so how do you understand these well if i've got an irreducible cortic surface in p3 then by a junction, by a junction from the pair P3 delta, the pair delta zero is a log canonical pair, right? Because it means that delta is essentially, you know, collabial, but obviously can be singular. 
Um, but it's still an example. So this is an example of a, of a singular log uh, Calabi-Al pair. And by the way in which the adjunction works, it has the same co-regular, the co-regularity is um, preserved. So the max, the log canonical centers of P3 delta are strict to log canonical centers of delta zero. And then I can just resolve this singular surface uh, to get something smooth here. So this is a this is a now a surface Mac, uh, log Calabi Al pair, and by the classification of surfaces, I can I can split into one of these three cases. So either this surface is a ruled elliptic surface, so it has a map to an elliptic curve, the fibers are P1s, and the boundary divisor is the sum of two disjoint sections of this of this projection or um, it's a rational surface and the boundary is a smooth elliptic curve so those are the co-regularity one cases in which case the boundary is either in the smooth elliptic curve or the two copies of a smooth elliptic curve and if the co-regularity is zero then it has to be a, a Lewinger pair so it's a rational surface and it's an anti-canonical cyclin and then once I've resolved it like this, I can blow down minus one curves in this um, smooth surface until I reach a minimal model. And so let me, let me I won't worry about the ruled elliptic case for the minute. Let me just focus on the rational case. So if, this, if we start with a rational cortic, then maybe by blowing up more if necessary, we can always arrange for this um, minimal model, you know, blowing down minus one curves to end with a copy of P2 and an elliptic, well, a cubic curve. So E is a cubic curve. It's either, it's either got, I mean, it has to be a maximal log labial pair. So it's either a smooth cubic curve, a triangle of lines, or a node, you know, a nodal boundary device. One of the cases we had before. And therefore, we get parameterization. And obviously, if it's rational, it has a rational parameterization, and this construction gives us one. And so we can look at the linear system that defines this parameterization. And so these rational cortex three, um, surfaces have been classified. So if it has isolated singularities, classification actually goes back to Noether uh, from 1889. So this is the one time of managed to quote a paper from pre-1900 in German. But I mean, it's amazing that, uh, you know, it was done such a long time ago. But anyway, that was kind of nice when I found it. And um, the so as I say, you know, cortex surfaces with singularities has a very, very long history. Uh, and in the case in which the surface is not normal, so it has non-isolated singularities, I mean, possibly, the class of, you know, possibly you can find them in Jessup's book, but at least in the terms of which I've described it on this slide, they're classified by Urabi uh, from 1980s. And so let me summarize it for you. What happens? So what's the point of this? So I have this plane P2 with a, with a cubic curve E in it, and then I'm blowing up, I'm doing a volume preserving blow up to get to this smooth model here. So that's I'm blowing up points in the boundary, either at nodes or at smooth points on the boundary. And if I if I let H be the the class of a line and EI be the class of each of these minus one curves, I mean the points can be infinitely near each other and they can also be infinitely near the nodes. But in any case, in general, there will be minus one curves. Then essentially I'm just trying to classify linear systems in P2 that have degree four. So if I take four, if I take cortex that pass through 12 points and each of these 12 points live on a cubic curve, then um, when I blow those things up, uh, I mean, that's a four dimensional linear system. So, and it's got degree four. So it's going to define for me a cortex surface in B3. What happens to the cubic curve? Well, if I blow up 12 points on a cubic curve, the self intersection drops down to minus three. So the, the cubic curve is then contractible. It contracts to a cusp singularity or a simple elliptic singularity if it's smooth, but you know, if it becomes nodal, then it's a cusp singularity. So 
In fact, this E6 case, this A1 case, these are all cubic surfaces that have a triple point. You can define them, you can describe them by this construction. And then similarly, for the other types of simple elliptic singularities, you've got these similar explanations. So if I take sextics that have double points at seven and uh, vanish at three other points on a cubic curve, blow all of those up and contract the cubic curve, then I get a quartic surface with an E7 singularity and so on and so forth. So the interesting thing is there's actually two different ways in which you can have an E8 singularity from these two different linear systems that are non um, that are not Cremona equivalent. And for these non-normal cases, okay, some of these linear systems, obviously this, this case here, 3H minus the sum of five EIs, that's defining from your del Pezzo degree four, that obviously is the intersection of two quadrics in P4, in P4, right? So actually this linear system has got dimension five. So I have to pick a generic four dimensional linear subsystem there, which just corresponds to projecting that del Pezzo surface down one dimension. And similarly for these final two cases. So if you remember in my diagram, I only had B1, B2 and B3. I didn't have this case before. So why don't I not have the case before in my picture? Well, as I said, A1 is the case in which the surface has a triple point or an E6 singularity. B4 is this case of Steiner's Roman quartic surface. So if you know that, it has singularities along three lines and the three lines meet at one point and at that point it has a triple point so in that case it's a degenerate version of a1 so i don't bother to include that one because it's contained within this case a1 when i construct the map that untwists a1 it also untwists b4 for me and the case of ruled elliptic surfaces also have a similar classification due to amezu and, and in the non-normal case urabi and you can treat them as degenerate versions of these rational cases. So they also just fit into the families I've already defined. The only other thing that we need to consider to worry about are the reducible cortex. And this division into four cases looks a bit arbitrary. The reason why I consider it is it's the thing that works in my proof. There's no special reason for it, but my family C1, these are all of the cases in which the boundary consists of a plane and a smooth cubic surface. C2 is the case in which it's two quadrics. C3, a plane and a singular cubic surface. And in C4, this is the simplest case, the case that I'm trying to reduce everything down to is when I've got a plane and the cone over a cubic surface, over a cubic curve. And once I get down to that, my theorem, proof of my theorem is, is simple. So let me tell you a bit about three-dimensional Cremona transformations. Oh, I should speed up a little bit. Sorry about this, but I think that the rest of the talk is going to go a bit quicker. If you want to classify birational maps of P3, a good thing to do is look at the bi-degree of, of a map. So the bi-degree of a map is not just the degree of the map, but it's also the degree of the map paired with the degree of the inverse. So in dimension two, I think we take for granted the fact that the degree of a map is equal to the degree of its inverse. In dimension three, this actually isn't true. And so maps of low bi degree are very well understood. Pan, Hollinger, and Wust have classified them in the case in which the map has degree two, and Desserti and Han have, or at least, I think they've done up to, to, to k equals five, but um, it doesn't go very much beyond that anyway, I don't think. And in my classification, I use some of these maps and um, I can almost exclusively just use maps of very low bi degree. So maps of bi degree 2, 2, 2, 3 or 3, 3. Let me explain what these maps look like. The map of bi degree 2, 2. So this is a quadratic map with a quadratic inverse. You get such a map by picking a point and a plane conic in P3. So if I picked a point and a plane conic in P3, if I blow up the point and I blow up the conic, then I get a picture like this in the middle. I can contract the quadric cone over C and P back down to a conic, and I contract the plane through C back down to a point. So this map looks the same in both directions. In one case, I'm blowing up a plane and a point, and in the other case, a plane and a point, and one's being contracted down to a 
a plane and yeah, a quadric column. So the picture hopefully makes it clear. And the choice of P and C, you're allowed to, I mean, this is the generic case, it's allowed to degenerate. So the conic can be reducible, the point can live on the conic, but basically um, Pan, Longer, and Wurst give a complete deformation, give a complete up description of how many different maps you've got in this case, even in all the degenerate examples. And they exactly tell you how many dimension of, of these map spaces of maps there are. The maps of by degree two, three, well, you get a map, a quadratic map by picking three points and a line, and then you look at all the quadrics that pass through those three points and a line. That defines for you a quadratic map because there's exactly four of them quadrics, four dimensional space of quadrics that do that. The inverse actually is a cubic map. So in this case, the inverse is given by all the cubics that vanish to order two along one line and order one along three skew lines that, that meet this one line. So they look like that. And the map of by degree three, three, well, this is the classical cubo cubic Cremona transformation. It blows up a curve of a space curve of genus three and degree six. And then that thing has a ruled, there's a ruled surface of degree eight that vanishes three times along that curve. That ruled surface can be contracted down to an isomorphic curve. That's the general member of that family of maps. And in particular, it's we make a particular use in one case in which this curve becomes degenerate. So a de the curve is also allowed to become degenerate, of course, if it splits into the union of a um, a twisted cubic gamma and three secant lines, then that's a degenerate version of this curve C. And there's a similar description for the map in this case. So let me explain these 10 maps. I'm trying to build this flow chart of, of different families connected by different volume preserving maps. I'll just explain how to construct some of the more interesting cases. Once you know how to do a few, you can kind of do the rest of them. The, the, the much by far the easiest case, so the very the simplest case to understand is the case in which the surface delta has a triple point. So if you've got a triple point, so that's a point. So my coordinates are T, X, Y and Z. The point, the, the, the variable T only appears linearly. So there's a triple point at the coordinate point one zero 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 here. If I have such a point like that, then I can just consider this very simple map here where I send T to T plus G over F. So G is a quartic, F is a cubic. So T plus G over F is uh, has degree one as a rational function. So this is a, is a well-defined map. And what happens is this blows up the triple point and it contracts some number of lines inside the, the the surface delta, it sends delta itself onto a cubic cone, cone over a cubic, and the exceptional divisor over the triple point is then a plane that meets this thing. So that is the in the family C4, which I wanted. And one way to check this is, is you can just pull back a volume form. So if I pull back a volume form, which vanishes on the union of this plane and this cubic cone, then I just have to substitute in everywhere I see T here, I just have to substitute in T plus G over F, and I just unravel it and I find that if a volume form vanishes with a pole on the plane and the cubic, when I pull it back, it vanishes with a simple pole on the thing that I started with. More interesting is, is to understand what happens to some of these more singular cases. So the general member of the families A2 and A3, they had these cusp singularities. So cusp singularities, uh, sorry, simple elliptic singularities of type E7 and E8. And so how you can start to unravel these is, well, if you look at the equation for an E7 singularity, at least in local coordinates, it's hom weighted homogeneous of degrees two, one and one. And similarly, in the E8s, weighted homogeneous of degree 3, 2, and 1. So obvious thing to do is to do a weighted blow up with those weights, right? That you can you can make that into a volume preserving divisorial extraction. And then once you've extracted this divisor, you can then follow a Sarkisov link and you can get a volume preserving, you know, Sarkisov link to something else. So if you do it from this E8 singularity, you end up 
going to P1123 with a certain boundary divisor. And if you do it from this A2 singular family, you end up going to P1112 with a certain boundary divisor. And in this case, this boundary divisor, what it is, is it's a plane. So the plane is the exceptional divisor over the point that I blew up, the weighted blow up. It's a weighted plane, actually, I guess. It's a P123 in this case, and it's a P112 in that case, maybe. And what it does to the boundary divisor that I started with, the delta, is it sends it onto a del Pezzo surface, either a del Pezzo surface of degree one in this case. Obviously, this is the thing cut out by a hyperplane in this space. And a del Pezzo of degree two. Sorry, this is a sextic in, in, this, in this space, and this is a quartic in this space. So you get this boundary divisor that looks like a del Pezzo with a plane. And then once you've got these two families, you can link them together in a little diagram like this. So these maps at the bottom, they birationally contracting a line in this del Pezzo surface, BD of degree D. And um, you know, you can write down in explicit equations maps that send this space onto this one and this one onto this. So here, the divisor D1, that's a, a plane and a del Pezzo degree one. D2 is a plane and a del Pezzo of degree two. And then D3, the guy at the right here, is a plane and a del Pezzo of degree three. So that's a smooth cubic surface. So this guy who lives on the end here is exactly in the family C1, which I defined, which is the the set of all boundary divisors, which consist of a plane and a smooth cubic. So that helps link some of the diagram maps in the diagram together. Unfortunately, the rest of the diagram is a bit of a pain to construct. One of the hardest things I had to do, deal with was the case in which the, the quartic surface is singular along a line. So if it's got, generically, it's got double points along a line, uh, well, if the if it's generic, if it's generic, then you can just argue as follows. So if I've got double points along a line, then if I take a, a plane through that line, then it intersects the rest of the intersection with the surface is a is a conic, right? Because the line appears with multiplicity two. The surface is a quartic, so the the residual part there is a conic. So I get a pencil of conics in my surface delta by considering planes through this singular line, and it has eight reducible members. So eight, for, for generic choice of delta, there are eight values at which this pencil of conics has splits into a triangle. And so I can pick three skew lines from three of these eight degenerate fibers, and then I've got a line with three other lines sticking out of it. So I can apply one of these maps of bi degree 3, 2, where I'm vanishing twice along the singular line and once along each one of these lines. So if I do that, I get a volume preserving map. I can resolve it explicitly, calculate all of the discrepancies and stuff that appear. I get a volume preserving map and it sends this quartic onto the union of a plane and a cubic surface. So the plane is blown up. The plane is the exceptional divisor for the line. And the cubic surface is the image of the quartic. And the inverse map, so the inverse map has to blow up three points and a, and a line, right? So the three points actually lie on the intersection of the plane and the, and the cubic surface. And the line is one of the lines inside the cubic surface. And so the hard part in this case, the reason why it was difficult is that you obviously have to deal with degenerate cases. So for example, this is, the, this is in, in the general case, but that you know maybe in some specially degenerate case you don't have eight reducible members maybe you only have two and then how can you pick three skew lines so you have to worry about stuff like that and the last one that i'll explain is uh, the case of cortex that are singular along a twisted cubic curve so cortex surfaces can be singular along either a line a conic or a twisted cubic curve or the three lines of the steiner's surface and in this case, fortunately for me, this is the only case in which Mellor's construction produces a volume preserving map, but it's very fortunate it happened in this case because I don't know how I would have come up with this one, but you know, maybe eventually. 
This is the case in which we consider degenerate cubic, cubo, cubic Cremona transformation, where the base locus is a twisted cubic and three secant lines. So the reason being is that we take the the twisted cubic in the in in the in the singular in the singular cortex. You can prove, or Mello proves, that the cortex has to contain infinitely many secant lines to this uh, gamma. In fact, you can tell exactly which ones it has to have. And because it contains infinitely many, I can pick three of them, and therefore I have a degenerate curve of degree six, uh, sorry, degree six genus three. So I can consider the cubic transformation that's centered at this thing. And if you if you unwrap that, the cubic, twisted cubic, you blow it up, you do some flops or contractions. The exceptional divisor over that is a cortic surface, and the cortic that you begin with gets sent to a cortic surface. So you map this pair onto a pair by a volume preserving map that consists of two, um, not cortics, quadrics, two quadric surfaces. And the inverse map also has to blow up a twisted cubic and three secant lines. So it blows up a twisted cubic in one of these quadrics and three secant lines to this twisted cubic that lie in the other quadric. And that map contracts one of those two quadrics. I guess it's the one with the three secant lines that gets contracted. Uh, yeah, so you can understand all the geometry of these things very nicely. And then eventually, we reduce to the case in which you're just left with a with a cone over a cubic curve and a plane. So that's at the bottom right of my diagram. And then concluding the theorem from that is is easy. So you can you can write down a very simple map that map there that sends it onto the divisor that I claim that you could always get onto, uh, where this E is either a smooth curve or a nodal curve depending on the co-regularity. And of course, I can use the dimension two result to get from this nodal curve to the triangle of lines in the co-regularity zero case. So thanks for listening. That's the um, end. Sorry, it's uh, quite close to 11, but yeah. Anyway.